Okay. Okay, Mark, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, I, I was asked to introduce myself, I guess. So first of all, um, I'm a native Montanan, was born in Haver, raised on a ranch near uh, Lewistown. Uh, educated, I have a uh, bachelor's and master's from the University of Montana uh, School of Forestry, but I took the range option. And it was really in the winter quarter of 1969 when I took the agristology class from Leroy Harvey, uh, who's in the Pioneers, Montana Pioneers booklet. Uh, he changed my attitude about grasses and sort of sent me on my way for a, a career with a lot of grasses involved. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is talk about um, mostly the native grasses in Montana. Uh, two thirds of eastern Montana is uh, uh, the plains, prairie, and then we have significant amount of uh, foothills and valley grasslands in the eastern or western third of the, the state. About 60% uh, of Montana is uh, native grassland. We're doing a little bit better than our Canadian neighbors. Uh, Saskatchewan lost about 80% of their grasslands to, to the plow and Alberta about 60%. Uh, grasses, <clears throat> generally speaking, about 60 to 80% of the biomass is below ground. And uh, that means a whole lot of roots. And they are capable of sequestering uh, carbon. Uh, there's different studies uh, showing that anywhere between 0.3 and 1.7 metric tons per acre per year can be accumulated and stored in the, in the soil below uh, grasslands. And that's the grasslands, of course, that are in, in, in uh, really good condition. <clears throat> I will talk about the um, different grasses we have. Of course, there's the natives. And we have the introduced, and then we have what I refer to sometimes as uh, uh, naturalized. We have over 400 uh, species of natives and grasses in Montana and about 75 different uh, genera. The introduced species uh, were brought in to the United States mainly as forage and pasture species. The grown grass down in the lower right corner, it was introduced from uh, Hungary in 1884. And then during the, the Dust Bowl era, uh, plant breeders kind of got in a panic. And the Westover Enloe expedition in 1934, 1936 went to Turkey on over clear over to Kazakhstan. And that's where they caught most of the uh, wheat grasses and wild rice that are used and contaminating some of our areas now today. The naturalist naturalized species, I consider them those that are introduced, but they have kind of found a niche in, uh, in somewhere in uh, Montana without being extremely uh, weedy and aggressive. Different types, uh, the bunch grass, of course, uh, there are clumps and then have fibrous roots. And you can see with this demonstration, what uh, extensive grazing can do to the root system and, uh, of course, the carbon sequestration ability of the plant. Sod formers, um, they're just in a, a sod uh, spread by rhizomes, varying uh, difference between the individual plants, but they have underground uh, rhizomes that, uh, that the spread. Then there's the stoloniferous. These are the ones that have the above ground runners. And these are basically just like strawberries. We have uh, long-lived perennials that are outcross pollinated, short-lived, and then uh, the annuals. Uh, there was a study done down at the sheep range in Dubois, Idaho, just over Monida Pass, and they actually tagged and monitored species, uh, different grasses, for several years. And they found that the long-lived perennials generally last; individual plants last from 35 to 50 years. Uh, the short-lived perennials, they're the self-pollinated ones, 
Uh, they only last five or six years, uh, but they're such prolific seed producers that they uh, tend to uh, shatter and, and proliferate themselves. An annual like six weeks fescue, it exactly the name implies they only last about six weeks. They, they're very opportunistic, kind of weedy, uh, but they're all done by uh, mid-May and all, all starting to dry up. Um, they produce seed in different manners. Uh, primarily, most of them have the sexual reproduction where they have the anthers and the pistils male and female plants, uh, parts of the plant that produce the seed. Then there's uh, epimictic, and these are ones that uh, actually the seed is developed by differential cell division. They just decided that they, they make a, uh, they, different cell division uh, results in the development of seed. And Kentucky bluegrass is, is one of those. Then there's a viviparous, uh, where it's, looks like it's a seed head and all sorts of seed, but it actually it's a, uh, a plantlet. So it's, uh, it's dried up and it'll fall to the ground. And once it's hydrated, roots will just pop out the bottom and, and uh, the plants start. Uh, Bulbous bluegrass is a prime example of, of that type of propagation. Then you have the monoecious or dioecious, where the monoecious where both the pistillate and the staminate Parts are on the same or within the same flower, dioecious. Uh, you have the separate male and female uh, flowers, and they can be on the same plant, or else they can. There can be male plants and, and female plants, and we'll show examples of those in, later on. Uh, most of what we have is considered uh, short grass berry. You don't get into the mid grass and the tall grass until you get further, further east into Minnesota and Iowa and Indiana, Illinois, and so on. So everything we have is, is considered a short grass, but we have we have the tall species like basin wild rye, the mid like uh, rough fescue, and the shorter stuff like buffalo grass and blue gram and so on. Then there's uh, C3 and C4, or the cool season and the warm season. Um, the cool season uh, start growth very early in the spring uh, and the plants through photosynthesis utilize carbon dioxide and water and, to make starches and sugars for, to, that they feed upon. Uh, and the first molecule that is uh, formed is a, a three carbon molecule, thus the, the name C3 for cool season. Warm season, uh, they require a lot more temperature before they even wake up in the spring, and uh, they're actually more water efficient. So they uh, are more efficiently growing during the, the hotter, drier part of the, of the summer. And the first molecule that's formed in that process is a uh, four carbon molecule, so that's the, the C4. Uh, in uh, determining or identifying uh, grasses, uh, the, in, the inflorescence or the seed head is a, a pretty good clue. Uh, panicle, spike, or seeing a panicle uh, branches off the, the main rachis. It has primary, secondary, tertiary, sometimes even quaternary branching. The spikes are sessile to the central rachis, and the raceme is a combination of bo uh, both of those. It has the branching, but uh, the final part is sessile to the, uh, the pedestal. In the uh, anticles, you have the compact, which are very closely knit together. But they almost look like a spike, but there's little stems in there, hidden in there. Uh, then the open panicle, and then a diffuse panicle. Uh, then on the bottom there, we have the, the spikes, uh, which are the individual flowers are connected directly to the central rachis. And then um, the raceme, as in blue gram and uh, cord grass, you see where they have a branch, a primary branching off of the rachis, but then uh, they're sessile to the, to the stem. Uh, the flowers are called uh, spikelets. The uh, spikelet is made up of uh, two glooms, that's the very bottom bracts, and then um, 
the one to many flowers. And then it has the, the individual flower has the um, lemma and the paleo. The lemma, lemma I uh, say it's, it's like the turtle shell and the paleo is like the uh, belly plate of the turtle. So one, the lemma is the main one that encapsulates the, uh, the, uh, the sexual parts, the, the stamen and the, the pistol. You can see uh, with this example that uh, the blooms are on the bottom and then uh, one of the many flowers uh, down below that. Uh, also the appendages on the seed is kind of a clue for some of the, some of the species. Uh, you can have them right off the tip. Uh, they can be uh, curly and twisted and like a needle and thread. Uh, and the, the uh, on can come from the, the tip, the back, below a bifid tip, like on the upper right, or come from uh, anywhere along the back of the, of the lemma. And then also you have all sorts of hairs and, and bristles that can come off of the, the seed. And those are uh, good characteristics used for identifying different species. And vegetative, you know, if you don't have a seed head, uh, there is a lot of clues in uh, vegetative characteristics in what's called the collar area. You have the sheath, which encloses the stem. The stem goes on up beyond, and then the, the blade, the leaf blade breaks off of that. The sheath uh, down below is wraps around the stem, and if it's open, it's, I equate it to like a bathrobe. If you have one side goes in and then the other side folds over, uh, then the closed is actually where it's fused just below the collar. Uh, and it, you peel a leaf around the way it often tear real easy, so you have to be careful. But I equate that to like a, a V-neck sweater. Um, the blue grasses are also closed, but it's further down. It's more of a plunging neckline with them. Then you have the uh, uh, you have the oracles, which are little uh, appendages. They can be just a nubbin or like this one, where they're actually clasping around the stem. Uh, and then the oligial that comes off in the back of the uh, the sheath, uh, right up against the blade, and that can be a membrane. It can be hairs. Uh, it can be a combination of both membranes and hairs in various lengths and, and shapes and sizes. And then uh, the leaf plate itself can be uh, uh, flat and, or it can be uh, uh, rolled or in some cases it's actually quite folded in its appearance. <laughs> so that these are uh, different characteristics with the, the seed and the vegetative characteristics all can be used to, uh, to uh, help identify. But what I've done is broken them down into groups that have uh, similar characteristics. So the first one we're going to go into is the uh, Tradicia tribe, uh, which has spikes, it has a membrane uh, for a ligule, and it has uh, oracles, and it can be uh, uh, on, usually from the tip, or, or no ones at all. And then the florets have two to many uh, many flowers uh, actually spike uh, okay the spikelet has uh, two to many uh, florets within the spikelet <clears throat> the first one I want to get to is our state grass uh, blue bunch wheat grass uh, it is really quite easy to identify because it's it's clumpy nature and it's usually in the uh, sites where it's in good condition. It, it's a decreaser, so if there's heavy grazing, so on, it's one of the first to go. The main characteristic is the, the seed head. It, the awns are straight until it starts to mature, and then they, they make a 90 degree turn and stick straight out. So it's what's called uh, diversion awns. Uh, Blue bunch wheatgrass is basically statewide. Uh, Western wheatgrass it is also on one that's uh, statewide. Uh, it's fairly easy to, uh, to identify because of the bluish color. It's a, it's a sod former. It doesn't form a very tight sod. It has the uh, oracles that are usually purple. 
and it has uh, deeply grooved uh, leaf blades uh, on both the uh, both surfaces. Uh, in 1975, the state of Montana uh, wrote a new reclamation law, and uh, it stated that all reclamation in Montana had to be done with natives. And at that time in 1975, there was very few uh, natives in commercial production. A lot of the seed was wildland collected in Utah and didn't really like it a whole lot in Montana and Wyoming. And so uh, Rosanna Western Wheatgrass was one of the first ones to be released. It came out of Rosebud County, just north of uh, Forsyth, a little porcupine creek. But uh, it was uh, one of the main species used in the initial uh, coal mine reclamation in Fort Union formation, Montana, North Dakota, and uh, Wyoming. The other one was thick spike wheatgrass. Uh, this one uh, is a little, it's very drought tolerant, it's uh, very uh, hardy, uh, but there's a mix, there's four species that are they're all lumped into the same species now. But uh, thick spike is hairy and no on. Griffith's eye is hairy with ons. Stream bank is uh, glaucous, no hairs and no ons. And Montana wheatgrass is no hairs and long ones. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, this was the number one native selling species in the United States. Uh, and it, it continues to be one of the stronger ones because it is used, continued to be used on coal mine reclamation and both the highway department in Montana and Wyoming have uh, taken to using uh, thick spike uh, quite a bit. The main cultivar is Critana uh, for critical area stabilization. This was collected by Dr. Don Ryerson, who is a, a range professor uh, at Montana State University. He collected it up by uh, between Big Sandy and Box Elder. And I actually found the site is, it's, it's about only about three acres and it's uh, three sides of wheat field and the other side is uh, the road. But uh, there is a lot of diversity in that because that's where it came from originally. Uh, you notice down in the left lower how the uh, spikelets overlap from the one of the next one across from it, it overlaps about a halfway. But in slender wheatgrass, which has a real slender uh, uh, configuration, and it doesn't overlap quite as much as the other ones. Slender wheatgrass is a uh, self-pollinated species. Uh, doesn't last very long, but is commonly used in mixes. Uh, but I have to offer some caution. It is very aggressive. Uh, it, it develops really quick. And it is recommended that no more than 5% of the seed be uh, slender wheatgrass. The, the release uh, in Montana is called Prior. It is uh, also quite salt tolerant, but it has a seed that is 50% larger than the other ones. Now, if you're up in the mountains and you run across something that looks like slender wheatgrass, but it has awns on it, uh, it is uh, <coughs> uh, bearded wheatgrass but it's very similar to the slender. Uh, getting away from the natives, everybody knows what pressure wheatgrass is. There's, there's three different kinds of pressure wheatgrass, the pressure of certain Siberian, and now they've actually hybridized pressure desert, uh, called new high. But pressure wheatgrass is very aggressive. It was brought in to plant pastures on very dry sites but it, it literally takes over uh, and um, they are, you know, any government plant, any government paid planting is not, is not allowed to be grass to be a component. But it's even a small component that makes it eventually take over. The other weedy species is white grass and it looks much like Western, but it's greener, it's taller. Uh, the one main characteristic that I always use is that the very last sheaf, right, the one right on the ground, and it is often uh, mature and yellow or even uh, crumpled and as, as gone, but the bottom sheaf is hairy, all the other sheaths are not. So if you have a question about it, get down on your knees and 
look at that very bottom sheath, you might have to look at more than one stem, but if you find the hairiness and you pretty much guarantee that it's a crackgrass stem. <clears throat> Basin wild rye uh, is the most widely adapted species uh, in Montana. It, it is slightly saline and it does well in the acid around Butte and Anaconda. It will grow on sub-irrigated ground, sub ground and it's found growing in uh, red desert in the five to seven inch precip zone. Uh, it used to be very common. Uh, there was uh, some history writing saying that the grass in the Deer Lodge Valley was as high as the saddle on the horse. And I, we suspect that a lot of that was basin well rye. But it's been basically wiped out. Uh, Montana State University did a study. They determined that this is the only species that has, or one of the only species that has an elevated growth point. The actual growth point is about four to five inches above ground. Almost all the other ones are right at ground level or even slightly subterranean. So if it's grazed or hayed, uh, it'll eventually get wiped out. And right now, Basin Wild Ride, the only place you find it is in like a railroad right away or a road corridor or somewhere protected uh, where it, it actually actually grow. There's two different uh, ploid levels. There's the tetraploid. Uh, chromosomes of grasses are in, in multiples of seven in most cases. So the tetraploid, 28 chromosome, is the greener one and is more eastern and more drought tolerant. And the bluish one, I've actually seen the bluer one down toward Fancy. Well, it's the octoploid, which is the chromosome number 56. Uh, but uh, there, there is a well, there's a couple of releases of that. Uh, the tetraploid, there's a uh, trailhead, which was originally collected over by Roundup. And the reason it was called trailhead, it was collected near where the Montana Centennial Cattle Drive started. That's, that's the name. But if uh, you raise basin wild rye, do not harvest it during its active growing season, it will do very well. This bottom left picture is of a planting of basin wall rye along the Missouri River near Fort Benton. This gentleman planted patches of basin wall rye interspersed with uh, patches uh, of like five acre patches of uh, barley. And then when he harvested the barley, he left like a five, five foot strip all around the edges. And this turned out to be unbelievable pheasant habitat uh, and deer habitat. Uh, and also it's being used as winter calving pastures from basically Ronan down into Utah, where they establish the field going, they don't turn in until February, where they don't have a calving shed or they don't have uh, shrubs or trees to protect. Uh, the calves can lay in this stuff and be protected. And then later in the winter, uh, the cattle can actually get some grazing. You know. Two other wild rice. Um, the Canada wild rye, its characteristic is the, the big droopy head. It's uh, sort of an op opportunistic and somewhat weedy sometimes, but it uh, usually goes around the road cuts and, and places like that. And then you get up in the mountains into uh, little openings, some somewhat shaded. You get into the blue wild rye and the Virginia wild rye. Uh, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, the wheat grasses have a single spikelet between each position along the uh, rachis, whereas the wild rye have uh, two to three spikelets. And when they shatter the seed, the, the glooms persist. So this long picture, I took that picture this morning of a mammoth wild rye, but all of the seed is shattered out and uh, the persistent glooms, that's cut pretty much characteristic of the uh, wild rice you have the persistent blooms. People have used this mammoth wild rice seed heads for uh, floral arrangement, right? All sorts of different colors. And, and then the stem is about the size of a, a pencil. And, and people have used the stems for uh, potting stakes in, uh, in the greenhouse. Uh, bottle brush squirrel tail and foxtail barley, I put these in two together because they have one characteristic in common, and that's disarticulating rachis. The central stem uh, breaks apart below each individual uh, spike. Uh, bottle brush squirrel tail is very drought tolerant, and 
goes south of Bridger, just at the top of the Bighorn Basin, into like Lovell and Gravel and places like that. There's areas where uh, real heavy bentonite soils and bottle brush curl tail and gardener salt bush are the only things that can live in, in those areas. But um, bottle brush curl tail has four subspecies, and you can actually find bottle brush curl tail. I found it in uh, Yellowstone Park and in the Tetons at some fairly high elevation. Foxtail barley is, uh, is native, but it's rather weedy. Uh, you find it in uh, intermittent wet areas, slightly saline areas, and it has the capability of cross pollinating with slender reedgrass and it produces uh, almost meconia, uh, which is sterile. Uh, Poie tribe. It has a panicle, has a ligule of uh, membranaceous. Uh, and spikelet has uh, two to many flowers, uh, and the, the, the blooms are subequal, and uh, one or both are shorter than the, the lowest for it. Uh, let me go back. Uh, on this uh, picture with the, with the membrane ligule, I want you to note on the leaf the two grooves down that. That is a uh, characteristic of uh, bluegrass. It has what they call the railroad tracks down the middle, and then the keel, the tip of the, the uh, leaf is like the keel of a boat. So anytime you just grab a leaf, look at the look for those two grooves and the boat tip keel on the end of the leaf, uh, then you are pretty confident that you're dealing with a Kentucky or with a, a bluegrass of some sort. Uh, Sandberg bluegrass is uh, a very early, there's a lot of it all over, but it's a very minor component in most of the range mix of the range of communities. Uh, and it develops real early and cures up. And uh, by 4th of July, it's, the party's over for that one and just kind of disappears. Uh, then there's, in, in contrast, is the uh, big bluegrass uh, or ampla, what used to be called ampla. But somebody at the a botanist at the Smithsonian Institute has taken the liberty to group seven or eight species all into secunda. Uh, and I don't read at all, but uh, you can see that the totally difference of the uh, Sandberg bluegrass versus the tall. Um, it's much the taller, or the big bluegrass is greener, it's uh, taller, it lasts longer into the season. But we all happen to go with, <laughs> with, with uh, or secunda as the species on, on several species. Uh, to differentiate between uh, most of the bluegrasses, it gets down to the hairs along the lemma, whether they're on the edges or on the back keel. And that's the distinguishing characteristics for most of them. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass, however, is one uh, called uh, woolly. Woolly at the base has long woolly hairs. <clears throat> uh, uh, Canada bluegrass, uh, boa compressa. This is a this is an introduced species, but uh, it does very well in the granitic, granitic soils, particularly around Butte and a lot of, a lot of Western Montana. Um, some people consider it weedy. I don't think it's too terribly weedy because it, it's not really terribly aggressive and it, it fills a need, stabilizes some, some pretty droughty sites uh, without spreading all over. And uh, poa compressa because it is, uh, the stem is, is very flat. So you just try and roll the stem and you can, it's, it's, it's flat. And so that is the, one of the main characteristics on that. Uh, of course, the bubbles bluegrass, that's the one I said that was by Griffiths. It produces a uh, plantlet rather than a seed. And it, it is uh, pretty weedy. It just depends on, uh, on the uh, spring. If it's a real nice wet spring and there's a lot of open ground, it really, really flourishes. But it, it cures up uh, by midsummer. <clears throat> Rough fescue and Idaho fescue are uh, the two primary species in uh, Western Montana, uh, the very most important. 
Uh, as you note, both of them, uh, all of the leaves are, um, majority of the leaves are basal leaves, the tops. And then they have the, what they call a naked comb. The comb is the stem that uh, holds up the uh, inflorescence of the seed. So there's very few leaves along those naked comb. Rough fescue also has a character, well, it has a purple base, which is characteristic. It also has a, a bundle sheets. Uh, as the lower uh, leaf cures, the leaf falls out, but the sheath itself remains and it builds up over years. So it has a, a fairly layered uh, protection. This protects against uh, grazing, overgrazing, because it's protecting the growth point. It also makes uh, rough fescue very fire tolerant. Very, this uh, these sheet bundle sheets at the base really protect the growth point from, from fire. Uh, Idaho fescue usually has a bluish tint to it. It's much smaller, but it is uh, a very important uh, forage and stabilization species. And in the center picture, uh, I put that in there because. The blade uh, comes off from a very small portion of the back of the sheath. And, you know, the, the collar, a lot of the other ones, they kind of wrap, the blade kind of wraps around it. They say that this one, the two fes these two fescues and uh, pretty June grass, uh, don't have any shoulders on the, next to their collar. They all, it becomes, the blade comes right off the very, very back and they don't have anything sticking up the side of the stem. <clears throat> um, Idaho fescue, uh, blue color, and uh, actually has very black uh, roots. The species that is uh, quite similar to Idaho fescue, but is introduced, uh, most of them are from, from Turkey, I believe, uh, is uh, sheep fescue. Uh, sheep fescue um, is 88% uh, of the biomass is low ground. So, yeah, a lot of extensive roots. If you've ever traveled the interstate from Garrison Junction to Missoula and those big uh, road cuts north of Missoula, they are all vegetated with sheep fescue. And you may also notice that uh, it is so aggressive that uh, there'd be napweed in the railroad right away. And as soon as the napweed gets to the fence and up to the Sheep fescue stand, that, uh, very little that will tolerate that you can compete with a sheep fescue. Sheep fescue is also one that can be used as an alternate for Kentucky bluegrass. If you plant it uh, very heavy, uh, it will form a, a, a sod and it will require less than half of the water that, and virtually no fertilization compared to uh, Kentucky bluegrass. And it doesn't really like to be mowed very close either. Uh, this is a stand at, at the Bridge Department Material Center between the Ponderosa Pond release. But there's others on the, on the center that have been there. Uh, sheep desk has been there for 50 years and still survive. And that's in a 14 inch piece of uh, Some people have called this the Swiss farming knife of grass. Uh, the other one, uh, sheep uh, spike fescue. Uh, this is a a species that's kind of lost, <laughs> looking for a home. It's been called a poa, it's been called a festuca, now it's called a lupopoa kinii. Uh, this is a uh, dioecious, it has male plants and female plants. And if you want to ever see a whole lot of it, uh, it is basically uh, taken over the switchbacks going up the Beartooth Highway south of uh, Red Lodge. Uh, this particular picture here is just out at Red Lodge, and I submitted that to the Montana what is it called? <laughs> a field guide. Field guide. Um, none of those alkali grass. This is the, the most salt tolerant grass that we have in Montana. Um, here, we are, here we are stripping seed to be used in a dewatered uh, hailstone basin. And because of the selenium accumulation, uh, <clears throat> Karen was involved with that as a toxicologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. 
but we just in that in an hour we harvested about 120 pounds of seed. Uh, it is uh, usually goes pretty much anywhere there's salt, and it has to be a little bit thing up underneath. It usually ha it has a rolled leaf and it has a very long leg. It's very and it's worthless for forage. I think there's something about salt accumulation that uh, makes uh, most of these salt plant species rather distasteful to most uh, raising animals. Two other species that uh, are in this tribe but are introduced just briefly, uh, orchard grass uh, in England, it's called foxfoot. But uh, the character, main characteristic on, is, on that is uh, very flat stems like the polar compressor. Uh, perennial ryegrass, is one that they throw into all these Kentucky bluegrass mixes and uh, it's cheaper seed and they throw it in to, to help with establishment. But the perennial ryegrasses do terrible in Montana, except for areas where they get snow in the winter and it stays covered. But if they get us exposed and gets warming and cooling, it kills off. We had, uh, we tested several uh, perennial ryegrasses released from New Zealand and the first First year we got 6,000 pounds of forage. The second year we got 600. Pretty much wiped everything out. The characteristic I want to point out here is that each individual uh, spikelet on um, all of the other uh, uh, spiked ones, the uh, they're turned so that the glooms are uh, sideways to the are uh, out from the stem. Or these are turned uh, uh, 45 degrees. 90 degrees, excuse me, so that the inside is uh, the inside gloom is right up against the stem, and the outside one is out. out. But the wheat grass and wild rice, they're turned uh, exactly 90 degrees from this. This is the only one that, that turns to in that direction. Stipe tribe um, it has the panicle, and most of them have a very long video uh, like this, and a lot of them have the rolled leaf. Uh, there's one one uh, floor per spike, spikelet, uh, and the glooms are equal and they're as long as, or in most cases, longer than that individual uh, floor. Indian rice grass is a great grass. Uh, they've sent, found, of course, they've uh, found that the seed. Uh, produces a gluten-free flour. Uh, so it's ground up. And uh, several years ago, Montana State University had a recipe contest uh, to uh, make various bread products uh, <clears throat> from uh, the seed of uh, the flour of uh, this. And uh, the first ones, first cookies that they made were like hockey pucks, but they've since learned to get the right texture in the milling and so on. Um, we had uh, a like four acre field of uh, Indian rice grass and the rimrock was one that we released. And uh, once the seed matured, turtle doves, one doves would come by the hundreds into this. And also, even it's not very leafy, but uh, this is very, very palatable to most uh, grazing animals, whether it be wildlife, livestock. So the, the, there is a Montina, is the flour that the Arrowhead Mills in uh, Denver, Colorado puts it out. It's one, one form of uh, gluten-free, one source of gluten-free flour. Uh, and needle and thread, this is the one where when you're a kid, you grab these and throw spears at each other, but it has a very sharp pointed uh, seed and then a, a curved uh, on. But in the upper picture, you notice all of those light uh, yellow leaf blades. Those are called a flag leaf. And that's the, the first leaf below the inflorescence. And you can spot a wood stand of needle and thread a quarter mile away. You can see those uh, flag leaves waving in the wind. The so needle and thread have, as you can see right above the seed, the uh, on is very tightly twisted and then the on is, is curved. When it's dropped, the, the seed is the heaviest, so it drops down toward the ground. 
then uh, the first evening, first time when there's uh, raised humidity, the awn will rotate in one direction, uh, go with a rounded part against everything. Then the next day it starts drying and it starts going the other way. And the, that end of that awn hooks onto something. And so it, then it starts to screw the seed into the ground. So about four days of alternating humidity at night and dryness during the day, that seed will actually screw itself right into the ground. And then about a week later, that awn will break off. You can go out, out in the late fall to a stand of needle and tread and there's nothing but awns laying all around. All the seed is uh, self-planted. Really uh, a new, unique situation. Uh, the other needle grass that's really quite important is you find green needle grass in uh, areas where western wheat grass is. It's kind of a, in the zone between the blue bunch air, blue bunch wheat grass in the hills and foothills in the western wheat grass in the, the lower areas. Characteristics on the green needle grass is that on each side of the collar is a tuft of grass and that a, a tuft of hair. And this hair you know, is very distinguishing. Uh, you can kind of uh, pick that out. And also the uh, awns on the, uh, the, the seed are what they call twice geniculate. Geniculate refers to the bending of a knee, half its genuflect. Uh, this is, uh, so you can see it's bent twice about the shape of a knee. There are uh, a lot of uh, intense species of needle grasses in, in uh, Montana and and I put in this uh, Western needle grass primarily because it is hairy. The stems are hairy, the leaves are hairy, the seeds are hairy, and the awns are hairy. But uh, where this one grows and really relishes, it's actually in the obsidian sands of Yellowstone Park. You, anywhere around the Old Faithful, you can find this growing in the obsidian, those dark obsidian sands, and the parking lot up at the canyon grows up there. Uh, it's a it's a pretty hardy little turkey, but it's, uh, we tried to raise seed of it and didn't do it. <clears throat> the Vinier tribe it has the panicle. Uh, uh, once again, uh, the membrane lagial, one to many flowers. Uh, uh, lemmas, I would mean, uh, uh, are from the base. And blooms are subequal, meaning they're not the same. They, uh, same length, and the second bloom is longer than the lowest bloom. <clears throat> prairie June grass, uh, prairie June grass is pretty much all over this, the state also. It, it, it's, in, it's in rough fescue, Idaho fescue stands, it's in uh, blue bunch wheat grass, needle grass stands, uh, but it has the, the compact head, but when it goes to, into anthesis, uh, you can see how it opens up to spread uh, pollen. It's, it's in anthesis for probably two weeks and then it closes back up again. Uh, just two others in this tribe that are, these are introduced, Timothy and uh, Garrison Creepy Park Sale. It has the, Timothy has that characteristic head. In fact, there's some entrepreneurs that actually have the, the seed head and the stem uh, called Montana toothpicks. It's all in shops around the place. All right. Garrison creeping foxtail, but it is it loves its water and is usually in a wetter area. It's quite weedy because the, the seed is so light and can float downstream and down the ditch and so on. Uh, Timothy is there's quite a bit of it around because it is the old horse hay. Uh, so in the park and forest service, uh, all along the trails, there's probably Timothy because uh, a lot of people packed in Timothy hay for their horses. Timothy was the main one for feeding and horses to use for farming. Uh, one characteristic is that it has a bulbous base. The base of it has a little, right in the low ground, is a little onion type bulb. But Alpine Timothy, which is the native, it does not have that uh, bulbous base. Sweetgrass, this is. Uh, uh, has that distinctive vanilla flavor, van vanilla odor. It has a purple base in the, uh, the, the base of the plant. Uh, Native Americans use this in a lot of ceremonies, and the uh, early pioneers use this 
grades of this and throw it in with our clothes to keep the clothes smelling fresh. But as with all uh, really strongly rhizominous species, it doesn't go to much trouble to try and produce seed. Uh, very seldom is a seed. We have a lease of it uh, called uh, Spirit. And that came from uh, the Sweetgrass Hills north of Shelby. Um, and the, Mr. Brown, I guess it's calling Farmer Brown, I don't know what his training is. He has quite a bit of it on his land and he's actually fenced some areas to preserve, make sure that uh, the sweet grass is there for perpetuity. The other uh, interesting grass is uh, grass. This is mainly in high elevation, has a purple tinge to it. Uh, when you grab the seed heads, it's really silky and smooth. It has the, the basal tufts and a really, really long ligule. The Chloridia, Chloridia tribe it has racine, uh, has a membranaceous uh, ligule, but it's uh, a lot of herring around it. Uh, and it has uh, one fertile for it and one that's free to reduce for it that may or may not develop into seed. <clears throat> Primary one is uh, blue grama. Uh, this is a, uh, it's a warm season grass, um, but it, it, it is as far as Helena and, and beyond. You can find it around Missoula too in Charleston. <clears throat> but it is a uh, uh, it has a characteristic uh, what they call eyelash shaped uh, seed head. Uh, and it is, uh, it's not very deeply rooted, but it, it responds to moisture. It, would, it dries out the surface soil more than any other plant uh, or grass that I know of. I had that, I did the research on that with my master's degree. And the permanent wilting point of most plants is 16 atmospheres, uh, bars. Uh, so it's a negative pressure, you know, it's a suction pressure. And so grasses were anywhere from 16 to 25. Uh, this one, uh, it dried out the surface soil to 80 bars. So, um, uh, one other one uh, of the grandma group, this one you don't find much Eastern than say Lewistown and Billings. Uh, it's used, it's used quite a bit now by the highway department. But the really, really interesting characteristic now of this one, it's a racine, but the each individual uh, floor comes off from alternate sides of the stem, but every other one wraps itself around the stem so that they're all situated on the one side of the, the stem. Really interesting. Uh, buffalo grass, that's the one that, uh, as the stolons, so the blue grama and the buffalo grass are both candidates for uh, native sod, and, uh, but they're both warm season, so they green up late and they turn yellow uh, early in the in the fall. But they're very low maintenance, require very low water, re don't require much fertilization. Uh, this one has the the male flowers and the, the female flowers on the same plant. And it forms a little burr that has three to four seeds of being burr. Prairie cord grass, um, it is very tough. It has very great big rhizomes that are, and very sharp that will drill through real heavy clays. It has a very flattened each of each one of those uh, uh, part of the inflorescence. Uh, they're very flat and sandwiched uh, tightly together. You usually find this along in uh, eastern Montana along. Uh, Intermittent areas that are intermittently wet and they're on the uh, shorelines. And there's a salt tolerant one, uh, alkali cord grass, also. Uh, Bromier uh, oops. has a panicle, uh, a fuse, a closed sheath, ligule, and it has many flowers and, and uh, once again, the sub equal uh, blooms. Mountain brome is uh, one of the natives that uh, is very important. It's a it's a self-pollinated uh, pioneer type species. You'll find it on uh, gopher disturbances, buffalo wallows, uh, any disturbance along road or a trail. Uh, but one problem with it in, in terms of producing seed is that it will, uh, there's something that triggers viviparity in its 
uh, on that card below, that's what I made up when I was giving classes at uh, Rocky Mountain College, shows the regular seed and then the vivipary, the vegetative propagules that be. It's I believe that like if there's an early frost that triggers something in the plant where it will abort the uh, seed process and create this vegetative thing. I've seen it on mountain brome and western wheat grass. It's also been reported on uh, some of the higher elevation fescues and uh, alpine timothy. <clears throat> and the uh, bromes are also very susceptible to uh, head smut. It's a fungus. It's on, it's on the seed, and actually when the seed germinates, the uh, pores attach themselves to the apical meristem and go all the way to the top of the seed head and uh, express themselves uh, when the seed starts developing and uh, it kills a lot of the seed and it creates this black dust. Uh, smooth brome, of course, is the uh, uh, brome that's very weedy. It spreads all over the place. It turns kind of reddish purple in the fall. And one characteristic you use is that on the about two thirds way up the leaf blade is this constriction that looks like an M. Or if you turn it the other way, it's what looks like a W. I uh, can't talk about grasses in Montana without talking about the winter annuals that are, as a group, are usually referred to as uh, cheat grass. They are really downy brome, Japanese brome, and hairy chess. Uh, the, the downy brome is this uh, one main one that we call cheatgrass. It turns reddish in the fall. <clears throat> and as you can see with the seed, uh, they're, they're distinctly different. They all, each have a highline margin on the uh, lemma, but uh, the, the downy brome is uh, dark and long and slender. And uh, Japanese brome is kind of like Japanese lanterns, but it's short and stubby. So they're very distinct in the shite sheep. Andropogone tribe is, uh, has the racine le uh, legule and or the membranaceous legule and uh, paired spikelets. And the fertile one is, uh, is on. The other one is. Uh, Penicillate, which means it's a, it's a, a female. Uh, so these are not going to be over in this area, except for maybe the little blue stem. As you get toward Great Falls, and maybe even, I haven't seen it yet around Vesta, but uh, in central Montana, it, the little blue stem turns real red and purplish in the fall. But the only place it grows is in little north facing draws where uh, snow accumulates during the winter. Uh, a big blue stem, and then there's sand blue stem, and Indian grass. These are very restricted to very extreme uh, eastern mountain. Paragraste, we're getting close, guys. Um, uh, have the panic, panicle, and it has a membranaceous ligule, but it is also very hairy around the, uh, around the uh, collar area. But it's a many flowered, uh, one to many flowers. But the main thing is it has a naked caryopsis, meaning that the lemon and paleo don't adhere to it and readily sheds a naked seed out. Uh, prairie sand reed, uh, there's a relief variety called Goshen that came from Goshen County, which is in the south, very southeast corner of Wyoming. Um, is does very well on real sandy sites. Uh, but uh, I was really surprised when we went to uh, Cypress Hills a couple of years ago on the last day of the tour that we were out and we stopped for lunch and and there was just and it's a warm season grass so it wasn't developed very far but uh I asked the leaders I says is that what I think it is and here in the middle Cypress Hills that far north and that far west was prairie sand reed growing and, and thriving it was really quite surprising alkali sacatone that's probably the second most salt tolerant of the species, but it is virtually useless as a grazing species. I saw it once down along the Powder River down by Broadus and raised it. It was in great big clumps, uh, two feet wide and uh, about four feet tall. 
and the sheep in that area mowed everything down like a lawn and they were laying in the shade of these rather than eating them. Uh, Sandropsy is the uh, species that uh, there's a lot of it around, but probably most of it is along roadsides. Uh, it's a warm season grass, helps late. Uh, and along the roads in June and July, the highway department goes and they mow the cool season grasses. And then these guys wake up and take over and, and proliferate themselves uh, later in the summer. But uh, in the picture of sand drops, you can see all of the seed heads. But uh, on that picture on the side, you see all those curved yellow uh, sheaves. This last year, which was very hot and very dry, thus it didn't have the energy to push the seed heads out of the sheep. And this, these plants are what's called clystogamous, meaning that they can produce, uh, they can uh, pollinate and produce seed uh, within uh, the enclosed sheep. So uh, anytime you go along the road later in the summer, you, you can notice uh, the amount of uh, sand drop seed uh, all across the state. Uh, it just finds, you know, on those uh, gravelly shoulders of the road, it finds its way and, and does very well. Now your podia, uh, I threw this one in at the last minute because in salt grass is the toughest kid on the block. Uh, it's very salt tolerant and it has male and female, uh, male and female flowers, but very seldom produces viable seed. But this one species is when, uh, in uh, industrial areas where they nuke the whole site we sterilize the soil or where the highway department is sterilized around the reflector posts. Uh, this is the first grass that will come back, the first plant that will come back into those uh, sterilized areas. They're a very tough customer. Uh, switchgrass, uh, there's not very much switchgrass in Montana, but you can go to any nursery and, and get it for a landscaping plant. But this is the primary species for cellulosic ethanol. Uh, they can state that they say that they can produce more ethanol from an acre of switchgrass than they can with an acre of corn. Corn is a carbohydrate derived carbohydrate to, to sugar to alcohol, whereas in the switchgrass they, they use the cellulose and digest the cellulose. Um, uh, in Mississippi, you can, grade, grade, uh, you can raise 11 ton per acre. In uh, northern uh, latitudes, you can pretty much just limit it to three or four tons. In Iowa, they're using this as a biofuel where they, uh, in the coal fired generating plant, they about 10 to 20 percent of the switchgrass they chop up and blow in with the coal dust. Uh, so, it, and it is very easy to identify with this triangle of there's right at the base of the, the leaf. I was in uh, Ecolac uh, or Alzada looking at a guy's pasture and he quizzed me. He says, what's that grass? I identified a manifestule and he says, what's that one? It's a warm season, so it's later. I got out and I saw that immediately. Uh, something, I, I, I knew it. Oh, oh and uh, looking at the seed of this, most Grass keys, the first division is seed uh, laterally compressed or dorsally compressed. These are dorsally compressed, they're compressed from the back. And then the, the blue stems are also compressed from the back. Uh, almost everything else is compressed from the side or just totally different. It doesn't fit in any particular category. A lot of the keys, if you go to a plant key, the grass key, first division often paces it. Seems laterally or grass. Okay, this is the last slide. Um, I just threw this one in for the, the feather reed grass. Um, most people call it Carl, Carl Forrester, but that's just one of the varieties. But the thing about this grass that makes it such a great landscaping grass is that it's a bunch grass, so it won't spread. Uh, and it's sterile, so it won't shatter viable seed all over the place. This other grass, uh, Miscanthus, 
this is, is also used as a landscaping one, but uh, presently there's a lot of research on, once again, cellulosic ethanol production. As with the switchgrass, it's mostly in the leaves. These have uh, solid stems, so most of the cellulose is uh, digested from the uh, stems itself, cellulose in the stem. This is at uh, East Lafayette, Indiana, uh, just across the highway from uh, Purdue University. It's a private company just testing this. Uh, the Miscanthus giganteus is sterile. This one is uh, fertile. Most of them come, uh, it's actually called Japanese silver grass uh, from the Philippines and Japan, but uh, all over Europe, they're doing a lot of testing. This particular stand here is, uh, its origin is in Germany. But the Excuse me, Mark. Seed. And that'd be uh, it. Well, we lost, we lost part of the presentation there toward the end. What happened? Uh, the sound looks like the screen froze right on your uh, Indian grass slide. So the last one or two slides. Here or how far back? I don't know. I'm not seeing any screen at the moment. It's black for me, but. Um, Mark, it was the uh, big blue stem, little blue stem Indian grass where it stopped for me. No, oh, it, it uh, oof. Right. Okay, it says down here, your screen sharing is paused. What do I do? Uh -huh. Should I push a new share? Can you unpause it? Yeah, you you could yeah either unpause it or, or just do new share. Yeah, I just I just did new share. Can you see it now? It hasn't changed. Okay, there it is. It? There we go. Yep. We go. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. I, I'd like to go back. Yeah, not, if you didn't get to see this picture of uh, the sand drop seed, it's really interesting where it, it's enclosed in the sheath uh, because it's warm season, it comes in after the first mowing. Really interesting. All along the highways, you'll see, you'll see that. Uh, and this is the uh, inland salt grass that I said was a tough gate on the block that would come in even after the sterilization of the soil. Uh, switchgrass. Uh, this is for uh, cellulose ethanol and the characteristic uh, triangle of hair on the leaf blade and uh, stressing the dorsally versus laterally compressed seed uh, is one of the first uh, divisions in the uh, dichotomous key on most grasses. And then the feathery grass. Uh, that is uh, a bunch of grass, but sterile. So it's, what you see is what you get. You don't, it doesn't spread all over the place. <clears throat> and then the miscanthus, which is the other cellulosic ethanol species, this particular one growing in uh, Indiana, but is origin, well, it's, it's from some test material in uh, Germany, but uh, most of it native, is native to Japan and, and, the, and the Philippines. So. Hopefully, hope you didn't miss too much. Sorry about that. That's okay. Was the triangle grass, uh, the, the base, the one you were referencing growing around Ikalaka, was that switchgrass? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, it was, the, the, he had just planted the pasture and uh, meadow fescue wasn't in the mix, but it sure showed up all over the place. And then there, here was in, in the middle of everything with these clumps of, of, of something that hadn't put up a seed head yet. And because it's a warm season, it's, it's much later developing. It's able to 
immediately tell what it was just because of that characteristic match. Hey, Mark, okay. we, ha we have a question here that says you mentioned elevated growth point on basin wild rye. Right. That seems so counter to grass traits. Can you say anything else about it? Well, it's, uh, research was done at, at Montana State University because, uh, well, it, they suspected that something, that it was so susceptible to, to mowing uh, uh, and the stands wouldn't last as long. In our, uh, in our seed production fields down at, at Bridger, we have the, the trailhead basin wild rye, and we, uh, we planted it and then we used, uh, we started <laughs> to use mowing as a weed control for the establishment year. And we had the, 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 the farm foreman was out mowing and got about a quarter way to, across the field. And I said, oh, you better not do this. We, we tell everybody that's got an elevated growth point and you're gonna fill it. And that quarter for the next five to six years, never caught up with the rest of the field that was not mowed. It was, it was amazing that, that just that one mowing and the seedling stage, the juvenile stage, started to affect it that much. And that's why you don't see a whole lot of it around because like, it, like I said in the Trilodge Valley, uh, when they brought all the cattle in to feed the gold miners, uh, they pretty much wiped out the piece of rye in the Trilodge Valley. But if that if that plant goes to maturity, sets seed, then you can burn it, you can hay it, you can graze it to the ground. Literally, there was a guy in in, in Utah that turns his cows into the this basin wild rye patch in February, and when he takes them out in May, uh, it's like a feedlot. And but when that that plant, unlike all of the other wild ryes, uh, you know, like Russian wild rye and some of the native wild ryes, when they get some moisture in the fall, they'll green up again, keep going. Once the basin wild rye sets seed, it goes dormant, totally dormant. And that's basically to protect that. That's, but, uh, that's, that's the only one that I know of that has been proven to have an elevated because like I said, most of them are at, at ground level or slightly subterranean. And like rough fescue that has that bundle sheath protecting the growth point. So Indian rice grass has the same kind of bundle sheath that protects that lower growth. Mark, here's another question. Um, can you suggest a book with, mon with photo keys for Montana grasses? Uh, my Bible is this one, uh, Grasses of Wyoming. Uh, it, it came out in paperback first and then the new edition. Uh, it has really good, it's all line drawings and stuff, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's my favorite. <laughs> that's one I always go to. I go to, I go to the Monocots in Montana sometimes and I go to uh, my own book, <laughs> but my, my book doesn't have all of this. It only has uh, uh, commercially available, usable species, but that's is why I'm going to always go back to it. Now here's one that <clears throat> this is, I guess, about the wonder of nature, but somebody says, what is it with that constriction that makes the am on smooth brome leaves? It seems so random, but it is so consistent. I have no idea. I have no idea. But, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's generally there. But I don't know. If anybody else has a question, you can put it in chat or maybe raise your hand or something. Oh, here's one. Uh, what do you tell folks who want more water-wise lawns? Uh, I, I forgot, uh, Pat, I forgot to tell uh, the plant source or 
source list is now posted on the website. And within a couple of weeks, we're uh, going to post uh, a water-wise grass. Uh, I, I summarized two studies that were done. One at Montana State it was a master's project at Montana State University. And the other one was a more of a cover species dryland low maintenance at the Bridger Point Material Center. I summarized those two studies uh, and the uh, landscaping and revenge committee will be posting that as soon as we um, get it all a little, little more editing. But uh, the number one species uh, turned out to be sheep fescue, and you have to plant it at about 500 seeds per square foot. Uh, it will eventually get a little bit lumpy. You're probably not going to be playing croquet on it, but it. Uh, it's very low maintenance, requires half the water that Kentucky bluegrass was. The other two that came up to toward the surface was the buffalo grass and the blue grama, but the limitation on that is that they are warm season. So it won't green up early in the spring as, as others will. And uh, it uh, turns yellowish in the, in the fall. And it being a uh, warm season, uh, Cool season grasses might, after five or six years, might start invading it. I had a blue grandma lawn at part of my lawn at Bridger, and I did have some cool season. In fact, I had some Kentucky bluegrass coming in. Um, but uh, with it being a warm season, I could actually swatch spray with Roundup or wipe once the cool season got taller. Uh, and it definitely took only half as much water as a Kentucky bluegrass, and I was on a really sandy site. So those three, the buffalo grass blue grandma and the sheep fescue are probably the top three candidates. Uh, depending on texture and color and all that, there's uh, things like western wheatgrass, uh, thick white wheatgrass. And, and, and the definition of a lawn is whether you want a nice, soft, manicured, green something, or if you just want low maintenance uh, cover, there's a lot of, a lot of, well, you'll see in this paper once it's out, a lot of options. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure, I'll have a meeting tomorrow, but we are the, um, I was involved with uh, you know native plant garden in it, uh, Ward 6 garden. But the people I'm associated with there, uh, with the uh, Helena Water Conservation Board, we hope to, in that bare area in front of the new Law and Justice Building, at the sign and the flagpole, we're putting in seven strips of seven different grasses that can that will be used as ultimate to the uh, Kentucky bluegrass, and so you will be able to visually see. And we'll be able to monitor how much less water it takes to, to maintain them in desirable condition. So hopefully this spring that uh, that, that uh, demonstration it's, it's not replicated, just seven strips of seven different pieces. My mention that if if uh, people are interested in looking at that uh, brand newly updated seed source guide that's on the MNPS website. Um, Beth posted a link to that toward the top of the chat. So um, you, can, you can go there to find the exact link to that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to Pat and uh, what's her name down there, Adele? Adele. Catherine <clears throat> Kane. Uh, Catherine was assigned to, to put that to, together, and uh, Pat, when, as soon as he turned president, uh, pushed all of us to help her get it done and get it on, on, the, on the website. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a timely matter. It's time for it, it to be upgraded. Yep. It's, a great, it's a great document. Somebody wants to know, what's, what's your favorite grass of all, ti all time? <laughs> the goat goat grass. <laughs> Actually, it my favorite grass is the one I haven't found yet. It's called ice grass on the top of the Beartooth Mountain. 
and it's listed in Wyoming, but I haven't found it in Montana. I haven't found it at all yet. It is, <laughs> I'm gonna find it someday. Yeah. But uh, if, you, if I'm writing a word out, a scientific name, I like Brutalua curtipendula. I like to write it. But uh, I worked for um, my, my first part of my career at Plant Material Center was uh, with uh, saline tolerant, saline seep. And uh, so things like Puccinellia and Sprabus are probably my favorite. Hey. Looks like that might be all of them. Uh, we have a thank you and probably many more. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I hope somebody, I hope everybody learned a little bit of about something they didn't know about. And those that are well versed in grasses, uh, thanks for hanging in there with me. <clears throat> okay. well, I owe, I owe all, my, all my interest in, in grasses to Dr. Leroy Harvey. Uh, he just, he opened my eyes to grasses and only got a B in his course, but it sure changed my life. <laughs> well, I was pretty good in his class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll stop the recording now and...